Can you hear that? Hello. Thank you all very much for turning up after a liquid lunch. I'm sure some of you had a liquid lunch. And you're not all have drowsing away there in the bushes. Uh, yes, I'm Simon Gorsworth. I, uh, I'm an Englishman living over in Washington at the moment. Work for Farbank doing, I don't know, stuff, playing around with rods and lines, basically, teaching and talking about spray casting and casting. And, um, you know, I've been watching some of these other presentations and you've seen some such good stuff. So I'm just going to do some real basic boring shit just for you lot, just because we start at the beginning. I like to start at the beginning. And how I want to start, kind of talk about some basic stuff like where does spay casting come from? It comes from Scotland originally. Around the 1860s, uh, there's a river in Scotland called the Spey. And what's peculiar about the river, big river, real strong currents, lots of trees, and people just can't do back cast and they can't wade because the river is so big. And so this style evolved so many years ago as a need. And in those days, the rods were wooden rods. They would weigh 50, 52 ounces. They were just monstrously big rods, 18, 21, 22 foot long rods. And luckily, things have progressed. Everything's got lighter, much faster, and more fun. But the important thing about the uh, de derivation of spay casting is it's in a country called Scotland, in the UK. And in the UK, there are certain traditions to be observed. One of the traditions in the UK is to always bless, oh my God, not that, always bless the people you fish with. So you have to have a hip flask. And your general blessing to the river, the fish, the fishing gods, and the people you fish with. So to you all, that's a good way to start a presentation. Anyway, I like to re respect traditions anyway. So you start with that. And uh, good single malt's the way. When you go to Scotland, a lot of the huts and gillies you go to, you arrive at the hut and the first thing they say, oh, you need a dram. Before you're even allowed to fish, you have to start off with a whiskey. So it's a good way to start each day. So let's talk about basics. And I'm kind of like to keep these presentations open enough so that if you've got a question, you'd have to shout it out. But if you have a question or there's something you want to see, please ask, right? We're real happy to to change the presentation and do something you all want to do. Um, how many people here are pretty new at spay casting? Let me just give you, get a rough idea. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Anyone up this end? 10, 11. All right, somebody at the top, 12. Okay, so quite a few. Like new as in never done it? Stick your hand up if you've never done it. Just give me a rough idea. One, two. All right, so what should we talk about in spay casting? Let's talk about what a spay cast is, first of all. Spay casts are a family of casts that don't have a true back cast behind them. Right? There's an overhead cast, the line goes behind you, goes in front of you. So if you do a line cast, that the fly line flies behind you, you're going to snag a tree if there's trees. Sometimes you have trees behind you, you can't do that form of cast. Now if you do normal fishing, the normal fishing, you're going to learn a cast called the roll cast. Whether you're a one-handed angler or if you're a two-handed angler, you might learn this cast called the roll cast. And that's really, I call him the, the grandpa of the Spey family. That is the founding family member of Spey. All right? Bear with me for a second. This will make some sense, I promise you. Um, so everything is going to come from a roll cast. So really, as an instructor, one of the things I do and I concentrate on when I work with people on their Spey casting is, hey, let's check out your Spey cast by looking at the first member of the roll cast. And I'm going to run through a couple of the basics on this just to give you terminology. That's pretty important. So in comprehension, that's also important. But in terms of terminology, there are three components to really, really be aware of. One is what's called the D-loop. The D-loop is simply the line that hangs from the rod. That little lump there, that's the D-loop. Two is the line that's on the water, 20 feet of it, whatever that is. That's the anchor. And perhaps the least talked about, and maybe one of the most important points, is the spot that the hanging line touches the water. And that spot's called point P. You can you kind of see it right there? You all see it? So if I did this, point P is there. If I did this, point P is here. Right? So point P is a moving spot, but it is the exact spot where your line 
hangs and touches the water. And I'm going to come back to that because that really does influence a few things on your, on your casting. So those are your terminology. And very simply, if we were to look at bow and arrow, and you imagine pulling a bow back like this and releasing the arrow, it's going to go a certain distance, and you pull the bow back like this, the arrow is going to go further, and you pull the bow back, you know, you're going to get a lo longer shot. And in, ca in casting, in spade casting terms, the bow and arrow analogy is based on how big this D loop is. So this D loop is really what makes my, my bow bend, my rod bend. Right, so the critical thing about any form of roll cast or spade cast is that I have a D loop behind the rod, but the bigger that D loop is behind the rod, the more that bow is pulled back, the more that bow is loaded, the more the cast will go out. So the D loop is one of the first things you should really focus on. And I'll give you an example here. I'm just going to do a basic roll cast and I come back into this position. You can see the D loop is hardly behind the rod, fractionally behind the rod. And if I do a gentle cast forward, it doesn't go anywhere. Right? I didn't put enough power in to make that work. So with this small D loop, I have to apply a bit more power and I can get the line to go out. Right? That's, just, that's just how energy works. If the rod loads, you don't do the work. If the rod doesn't load, you've got to do the work. Now, if I take that same cast, but enlarge the D loop, now you can see the gentle cast worked. Right? So the D loop is my friend. I use the analogy of a, to take a friend into a bar and you get into a bar fight, the bigger he is, the better. And this D loop absolutely is your friend. The bigger that D loop is, in almost every circumstance, the easier your spay cast will be. Whatever your spay cast is. And we're still talking about the roll cast, but just keep an eye on that D loop because that, as I said, is everything. So that's what the D loop is. And then the other part that I think is really significant to understand is this anchor. And I use the analogy of a train track. A lot of people use the analogy of a train track. But very simply, if you were to freeze in what's called the key position, so the key position is a term for where your arms are and your rod is and, and your line is, basically where everything is just as you're about to start the forward cast. So you could do a million and one different things, wiggles and shakes and jumps and flips, and then you get to the key position. And the key position is where every cast will start. So what it, what it, if you know your spay cast, you know a double spay and you know a snap tee and an ooslem and a peri poke and a wombat and a jelly roll and a switch cast and all of these casts, they all are going to get from a key position, which is here, and go forward. So let's talk about that. This is the key position. I've formed a D loop. I've got this little bit of line lying on the water here. And right now, hopefully you can see it. I don't know if the glare is messing it up, but hopefully you can see that that line is facing straight down the river. Can you all see that up wherever you are? Yeah? Okay, good. I like, thank you for nodding. Appreciate that. So why is that significant? Well, if you were to draw a train track or get even a five-year-old kid say, hey, Billy, draw me a train track. And Billy goes, oh, okay, Dad. Yep. And he draws two lines and a couple of little bars across. And the significant thing about that is the two lines, unless Billy's really bad at art, are probably parallel. Because a train track is parallel. And so what that means is if I have a train track lying here on the water, I want to make sure my forward stroke is absolutely parallel to that piece of line lying on the water. That's your train track theory. Here's your anchor and here's your forward stroke. They're parallel. Does that make sense for a second? Just hold that thought. All right, let me just show you a couple of versions. Here's my track. And I use like European cities. I'm on a little tour through Europe. We have London is down here, and we have Paris, and, and Milan, and I don't know, Stockholm, up there, wherever, Dublin, if you like, I don't care. Anyway, the point is, if you look at this line right now, it's kind of facing down to London, so my train should drive to London. If I make a cast over here, 
or over here where the line isn't facing, there's a completely different result. Let's just show you. Let's go step out a step. Here's my line facing down into London. I'm going to aim at Paris. Cast fails. Right, so the first thing is, you cannot do a good roll cast if you're diverging train tracks, if they're going different directions. Your train tracks have to be where you want to go. If I do that same thing and I now decide, okay, I'm going to go to Milan. Here's my track here. Something even worse is going to happen if I aim over here. Oh, shoot. So, the reason I'm saying that is because the first concept any spay caster should have after give me a good D-loop, a big friend in my, in my bar fight, is that wherever this line faces, this track, that's where you have to go. Right? The line faces there, I go there. And you come back and you get in the same key position, you form your D-loop and you go, here's my line facing there, all right, I'm going to go there. And you start putting out these nice roll casts. And then you go, I know how to do these lovely roll casts. And you get in this position and go, where's my line? Oh, it's facing over here. Good. Oh, that's a nice roll cast. And you go, look at that huge steelhead or trout right there. Oh, into position. Oh, oh here's my train track. Bloody hell, I've got to go back here again. How do I catch this fish? So what takes roll casting into spay casting is one very simple concept. Move your track to where you want to go. If I want to cast over here, what if I did something like this? Now look where my line is. It's facing here. I can finish with grandpa roll, make my cast over there, and the cast will work. So whatever spay cast you do, if you're new to this, you might get confused by all those terminologies and all the names of the cast. There's like 12 or 14 spay casts you can do with a two-handed rod. There's over 120 you can do with a one-handed rod. That's an entirely different program. It lasts about seven days. But with a two-handed rod, we've got about, say, 12 casts. And again, if you're new to this, you're going to get confused. I use this analogy of, of watching on you know, the, the Olympics, the Winter Olympics. And, and you, you happen to turn it on, and there's the ice skating on. And these beautiful dancers are doing all this stuff, and the announcer says, oh, there's a triple toe loop. Oh, that was impressive. And then they do something else that looks like absolutely identical to me. That's a triple salco. Oh, that looked good too. And then they do exactly the same thing. It's a triple flip or lutz or something. Yeah, they have all these terminologies. They all look like they spun around three times. And they, but they have different names. And if you're new to casting, you're going to look at all these moves and the line starts here and goes there. And you go, well, they all look the same. What is this double spay and how does that differ from a single spay and a snap tee and a peri poke and a wombat and an uslam and da di da di da And all they do, they just differ in how you move that track. That's all. That's all. And I want that concept really ingrained in your head, especially if you're new. And so without me making a forward cast, I'm going to run through the motions of a bunch of spay casts and I'll stop before I make the forward cast. And I want you to think of what my concept is here. My line is going to start downriver because I've been fishing and I haven't caught anything. And I want to cast it across the river because there's a big steelhead there. So there is a cast called a snap T or circle spay or sea spay. Looks something like this. But if I pause at the key position, you see what I have done. I've set up a track across the river. Can you all see that? Does that make sense? Okay. Here's a cast called a jelly roll. Different move, but what happens when I'm in the key position? There's a track across the river. Right? Here's a cast called a single spay. I'll just do a modern one. Same thing. Pause. Where is the line? Facing across the river. Here's a double spay. Pause at the key position. I don't need to go on and on, but do you see the point? The point is you're doing something to get your line to go where you want it, to set up the track. If you can do that, you can have 
this, not this hat, it's my hat, but you can have a hat and that hat will have two words, Spey Ambassador. And you're proud because you've earned a Spey Ambassador's hat. And, and how you earn that hat is you live by one simple rule. You will never make a bad spay cast. It's a good rule. We'd all like to live by that rule. And in some ways that might sound a little flippant, but I think you can live by that if you always understand, follow the track, right? Wherever the track is. So let us say my track, my objective was to cast, was that Paris? I think that was Paris, right? Over there anyway. And let us say I did something like this. And I came up to the key position and I'm all excited to fire to Paris, but my, late, my track is up here. It, what do we call that? Stuttgart, Stockholm, Dublin? I don't know. I forgot what I'm talking about. But my track's not facing here, it's facing there. So if you do a casting stroke and you're ready to go forward, find the track and follow it. And if you follow it and you do it close, is that not working? Is that what that signal is? What's that? Not working? How's that sounding? Or should I zoom my zip? Oh, technical issues. Can, can you hear that? Sort of? Okay. Anyway, thank you. So, and that's the difference, right? That's where you earn your Spay Ambassador hat. Because you might get distracted by this enormous fish. Wow. Oh, look at that huge fish. Oh, sh I can't, hang on a second, let me just cast again. And you're getting nowhere near the fish. Why? Because the track was set there. So if I'd gone over here, yeah, you get a nice cast. That's where you earn your Spay Ambassador hat, by understanding how to always make a good cast. Always follow the track, wherever it points, that's physics. You cannot break physics, right? The laws of physics are pretty simple, they're, they're set. And one of the simplest things on that in casting is you cannot have a track facing one way and aim in a different direction. Now, as you get into spay casting, you're gonna learn the triple Salco, Tole, Lutz things, the things that move the track in a certain way that gives it a name that professionals up on the bank watching you go, oh, you have a good double spacer. Oh, good, thank you very much. Or you can, you can kind of create a spay cast. You can uh, be fishing a run like this and you step on some very slippery rock, uh, slip, and you go, oh, and you come up, oh look, I've got a track, and you follow it, you created a car, it doesn't have a name, that thing, you just, somehow you move the track, and you follow it, and I think if, if more people understood how, just the, com the, the simplicity of spay casting, follow the track, get in the key position, have a nice little D-loop, they become, a, spay casting becomes a little easier for everyone rather than get too mixed up with the details of these names and set up strokes. As you get better, of course you need to know those details. But when you're learning, no you don't. Move the track any way you like. Do the surrender spay. I surrender. And you go, oh, hang on. Oh, look, I got a track. Yes, yeah, surrender spay. No such thing. I don't care how you move the track, but follow it. And perhaps above all rules, this is where I weighed out, above all rules, one of the things you want to try and never break is the rule to never cross the track. So if my line is starting here, and I've come out because I want slow water, you can see here's my track. If I follow that track, it's going to be okay most times. Follow that track. But if I cross the track, i.e. I go to the tent, you're going to tangle every single tie. Now, 
I'm usually a fairly polite kind of chap. And when I'm giving people casting lessons, very rarely do I abuse them or get a big stick. But if you cross your track three times a row, you're an idiot. You really are. Seriously. If you come up here and you're in this position and there's the line and you go, oh, oh, well, what happened? Oh, you just got a tangle. And then you come back and do it again. Well, second time I might, I don't know, blame the wind. Third time, you're an idiot. There's just no messing around. Don't cross the track. If you want to cast there, move the track and follow it, but don't cross it. I don't want to call anyone an idiot, but I will if you do it three times in a row, particularly. So a couple of basics, right? The importance of that train track is probably number one. Talked about this, this D loop and how important the D loop is and small D loop, pretty pathetic. Bigger D loop, much more important. Does anyone have any questions on any of those basic concepts at the moment? No? Okay, so let's expand it in a couple more things. I mentioned the word point P. Do you remember that little thing? This is going to be slightly harder to demonstrate because the water's flowing, but I'm going to give you an illustration of it. And I want you to use your ears. You should always use your ears when you're casting. And what I mean by that is that one of the things you're trying to understand is when you are in this key position, you have a formed D loop and a line point P is touching the water in front of your back leg relative to where you're aiming. I'm aiming here. Here's my back leg. There's point P. If point P is in front of the back leg, when I make a forward stroke, oh, hang on, I didn't hear anything. Yeah, that's good. That's the point. There's point P in front of me. Why is it quiet? Oh, it should be. I mean, it should be quiet. And it goes out very efficiently because if you do some weird little, there's lots of ways to make this happen, but if point P goes behind you, when you start the forward cast, now you can do a couple of things, right? I can lift this rod, now point P is in a different position. Can you all see what I'm talking about, by the way, point P? Yeah, over here? Okay, you guys okay? All right, so let me just show you the difference. Point P in front, or level. Silent cast, super efficient. Point P behind, even a couple of feet. You hear that little slurp? Maybe you can't from that range, but let me make it even worse. Point P back here, except it's on the rocks. You get that huge slurp, that big noise. It doesn't, it's not quiet anymore. And what happens when you get that slurp is you're sucking out all the energy of the cast. You don't get a good forward cast because this slurpy noise is identifying point P's behind you. To an Englishman, like me, it sounds like a Frenchman drinking soup. Not what you want to hear at the table next to you in a restaurant. <laughs> you just don't want that noise. True. If you're hearing a cast and you're doing a snap T cast like this, and you come round and you hear this, that's because point P was behind me. I shouldn't hear that noise. I shouldn't see that spray. What should happen is you time your cast right. So point P is slightly in front of your target, 90 degrees to your target. It's a little technical, but it's a really integral part of casting, spay cast in particular. Listen for that. Watch the spray. If your cast keeps falling in a mess, probably could be because you had this point P behind you. So those are some really good basic factors. Um, as I said, I like to start with the basics, give people an understanding of how to be a good caster. And the last one of those, perhaps the hardest one of all, but boy, is this easy to identify. And is this really hard to get right? Yeah, apparently. Is the forward stroke from this key position. I talked about the key position. 
right? The key position, the rod is angled at a one o'clock to one thirty angle, like tilted behind me. I don't want this rod vertical. I don't want this rod horizontal. I want this rod about there, sort of a 40 degree angle. What I do want is I want a little wedge between the bottom of the rod and my forearm. See that little wedge shape, pizza wedge? I want my top hand about shoulder height. I want it up here, down here. And I probably would like to have that top hand as far back as my shoulder, not starting in front of me. Okay, so that's the key position. Now, if you had a camera and you were to take a photo, and you were to take three photos, I would ask you to take three photos when I say A, B, and C. So for example, here's photo A, here's photo B, here's photo C. Right there. A, B, C. What does that mean? So that's how a really very successful, very powerful forward stroke, that is how it's created. The most important part about that is the difference between A and B is the hand position, not the rod angle. That is where so many people go wrong the first time they spay cast. The first time they pick up a two-handed rod, they're going to hold the bottom of the rod, hold the top of the rod, go click, photo A, click, photo B. Well, the rod is a different angle. My photo B was here. Their photo B is here. So the rod has started rotating. That will never ever result in a powerful cast. You're trying to load the rod with this move, it's called the loading move, funnily enough. And then you try to unload the rod with this hand now taking over and closing the wedge. Right, that's your, how a good forward stroke should be. A, B, C, close the wedge. And I'm gonna show you that, I, when a lot of people when you watch a good cast, a cast, somebody's wearing that ambassador hat that we talked about. They, they've qualified. They've, they've done some nice casts. They've never made a mistake. I've never called them an idiot. They've never crossed the track. They've followed the rail, train track every time. And they form these lovely little loops on the front of the cast. Let's have to take a little look. There's photo A, B, there's the C. Now, if I do that two or three times, just have a look at the loop in the front cast. There's A, B, C forms a very nice little narrow loop. It's not a lot of width. If you look at its trajectory, it unrolls parallel to the water and drops down. That's what you're trying to form. You're trying to form a loop like any other loop. How are we doing for time? Oh, I just ran out. Who's next? Air, uh, Al Burr's next, isn't he? I better hurry up with this because the best is yet to come when Al's here. If you don't do the ABC, if you pivot from this bottom hand, do you see the difference in that loop shape? Very ineffective, wide, very common to see. When you see people doing that, it's almost invariably because they drove the top hand over the bottom hand and didn't load with that AB, that translation. And, and I had about 904 more things to talk about, but Al Burr is up. And I'm going to let him finish off because he will show you some amazing stuff. But I want to show you why that D loop is so important. Why is this AB so important? If I do it slow, do you remember what it is? Is this good or bad? Big D loop, good, big D loop, bad. Somebody just go, good, bad. Good, thumbs up. All right, good, good, good. What, in slow motion, if I do this A, B that I talked about, watch this D loop. Stays behind, stays behind, stays behind. Ping! Fires off because I left my D loop. Great. Now let me do that in slow motion again with the wrong way. The pivot over the bottom. And in slow motion, look at this D loop. Look at this D loop. It's shrinking, it's shrinking, it's shrinking, it's shrinking, it's shrinking. Right? You're losing it. There is no friend. He's left the bar. You're all alone. 
And that's because people are pivoting over this top hand instead of thinking, leave the D loop behind and then pop the D loop off the top to finish your cast. I'm so sorry, I talked talk far too long. I wanted to go through some things that go wrong, things that go bump in the night. But Mr. Burr is ready to come down and he is the next gentleman. So if you have questions, come and find me. I'm up on that Sage tent. I'll happily answer them after you've checked out the next guy, Mr. Al Burr. So thank you all very much for hanging around. I appreciate it.